Thank you, Nick. It is a joy to be back at Cherry Street. I've always had a really big spot in my heart for this congregation, and not real sure why you let me come back so much, but I am thankful that you do. And it's good to be back with Nick. I got to be in his, uh, his class, and uh, we were supposed to talk about instrumental music, but I don't think we ever got to anything instrumental. Uh, but uh, we did talk extensively about the synagogue system, which I was, I just really was a treat. That was an excellent class. I always learn a lot from you and thankful for that. He always quizzes me on my eschatology and where I'm at and how I'm growing. And I appreciate that about Nick as well. Looking forward to this week and dealing with something that is really on my heart. An application that I think we have to make with regards to where we're at and uh, the timeline of human history. And uh, so if you got your Bibles, you might open to 2 Peter chapter 3. Follow along with me. You already saw it behind me. Uh, but uh, we will we'll look at this extensively. Uh, also, Kevin, I just want to say, I noticed you guys have really gone high tech now. And I, I actually get to, I, I have pictures. But on Sunday morning, it's always kind of a hassle for me to get here and get to the right person and all that kind of thing. And it's also, I'm a Mac man. And so I, sometimes I go to a congregation and it doesn't match up real easy. And you know, the fonts are off and all that. So I just say, I forget it. But I noticed that not only are you high tech, high tech, you've got a, a Mac computer. This is going to gel. We're just going to do good. This is good. So tonight I'll have pictures. Tonight we'll have pictures to look at. And it'll just be wonderful. And so come back and be a part of that, please. Uh, Nick mentions that there are several from here and other places who've been involved in MAP, and I'm so thankful for that. Uh, she's not necessarily from here, but, uh, and I'm not sure how Jenna, how Jenna Marsh, she's not your niece, she's your, like, cousin, second cousin? Sam's my first cousin, that's her daughter. So that will be her second cousin, yes. Jenna is my intern this summer at MAP, and uh, she has done absolutely phenomenal. What? Ben is Jenna's sister, which you knew that. Yes, and he's here. I saw I took his hand. Actually, I think yeah, there he is. Actually, uh, he she likes Katie more. Uh, that's what I uh, she makes no bones about that. She just tells me how close that they that would be uh, Jenna's sister-in-law, uh, Ben's uh, wife. Uh, <laughs> you got me all messed up, Nick. I don't do that anymore. Uh, where was I? Anyhow, she's my intern this summer and just done phenomenal. Just, I mean, just done phenomenal, and so very thankful. In fact, she's going to stay with me for another three, about two and a half weeks, because when I get done here, we go home for a week, and then we leave on the Make It Real Road trip, which is going up into the northeast and into Canada, and we'll do various service projects and all that kind of, and she's going with me on that for 13 days, so it'll be mid-August before she ever gets home, and she's been with me since uh, the end of May, and so uh, it's, it's, it's just really been a pleasure to have her. Uh, Jenna with us and, and all the work that she's got done. The MAP team is present tense in, well actually they're on en route to DeRitter, Louisiana for CYE, the church camp there in DeRitter where most of the Louisiana kids go. And phenomenal time. Uh, I won't be there obviously that, this week because I'm going to be with you, but I have been going there pretty regular over uh, the last uh, 15 years or so too. And uh, so uh, I'm just, uh, I'm thankful for all that's being done in various places. Do remember the, the Music Week. Um, uh, Joan put out some kind of a little bulletin on Facebook. They were struggling to get some male counselors. And so remember them. That will be a good week and, and that everything will go well. Now, oh, yeah, one other thing. And I'll probably mention this every time. I will get the opportunity to speak at a little retreat that is going to, it's going to be somewhat of an exposition on the book of James. And this is going to take place the last day of August and the first two days of September, Labor Day weekend. And it's going to be in Leavenworth, Indiana, which is not very far from here. And I've got some little brochure thingy dingies up here. If anybody's interested in more information, you can take one of these or ask me for it, and I'll, I'll make sure that you get one. But I'd love to see you guys uh, come to that event. I think it'll be fun to look at the book of James and from a very, very, very practical standpoint. All right, that's my segue into this morning's lesson. The book of 2 Peter is chapter 3, and we're going to stay there the entire time, Lord willing. Uh, we will bounce out of that and see uh, several complementary passages, but I really want to take and pick apart this passage. It's been somewhat my uh, custom for the last several years of my ministry to, to just stay within one particular text. I found myself, when I started my ministry, I was very much a, a topical kind of a preacher. And uh, no, I, don't, I, don't, I think topics are fine, but sometimes topics lend very well, especially for me who's somebody who's full of themselves, they, 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 they tend to lend really well to you just kind of going in whatever direction you'd like to go. But if you'll limit yourself to a particular context, I found that the Holy Spirit at least has a few more 
uh, guidelines for you and kind of has the rope around you just a little bit more to keep you within that text. And so I found myself, as I've tried to mature in my ministry and grown, I've tried to stay within a particular context and allow the Holy Spirit to use that context in order to develop the, the, the topic of the theme that uh, the Holy Spirit has for us. This morning's theme, and for the rest of our time together through Wednesday night, will be, if these are the last days. Now obviously I'm making an assumption by just giving you the theme, but I don't think it's too big of an assumption. In fact, the whole lesson this morning is to establish that these are the last days. And then we're going to go off tonight through Wednesday in making what I think is the most important application that can be made given our time frame. If these are the last days, what kind of people ought we to be? That's the big application. What, what should this do for us? I'll give you a, uh, an, an illustration. I regularly have a nightmare. It's a reoccurring nightmare. And it is, a, it, it is, a, it is a, one of the worst kind of nightmares. No one dies generally in my nightmare, but uh, it's worse than that because it's one of those nightmares where you just can't get people to move who you know are in danger. Now, I don't know if you're this way or not, but I'll give you a little bit of a background. My family, we, are, we find ourselves waking up in different beds almost every week uh, because we, we travel across the country, we're doing revivals and meetings and all of those kind of things. And I regularly wake up in the morning and I have to kind of shake my head a little bit to figure out what state I'm in. That just happens to me all of the time. But given that, we also cross time zones a lot. And given the fact that we're crossing time zones and that we're tired from a seven, eight hour trip, whatever it may be, it's sometimes difficult getting us to move in the morning, getting us to get up and get after the business, especially when it's a Sunday morning like this morning, and we're having to get up and, and take care of things with regards to getting to church so that we can be there on time, and make a good appearance, and make sure my shirt is ironed, and make sure that my tie is straight, and you know, all that stuff that, that goes through, because I'm the guy who's everybody's going to look at for 30 minutes. And so Cindy, she takes it very personal, and she wants to make sure I look good, and all that kind of, but, but uh, there's just all kinds of stuff that swirls. And there are, on occasion, there are moments when I just can't seem to get the family going. And I've made very self-centered remarks in the past to them. I said, you know, people are counting on me. I've got to get there. I've got to stand at the back and shake hands because people are counting on the, the revival speaker to be there, to say hi to. You know, and if I'm in a new congregation, they want to get some kind of a reference point with this guy who's going to be lecturing me, you know, for the next five, six nights. And then I've got to be there. Well, that's the background. I have this reoccurring nightmare, and in this nightmare, we are being pursued by, and it's various things, maybe it's the government, maybe it's a terrorist, it doesn't really matter, but they're pursuing us because of our religious convictions, and I just can't get Cindy and the boys to move. They know they're in danger, and I'm telling them they're in danger, but it's like they've got cement blocks you know, around their ankles. They just can't seem to get going. Well, I want you to take that feeling. And some of you have not only had dreams like that, but perhaps maybe you and your own family experience that kind of thing every once in a while. I want you to take that feeling, that oh feeling, and I want you to apply it to our present day scenario. I believe we are living in the last days. In fact, I believe we're living in the last moments of the last days. I think... That you and I, if we are to be fair with what the Lord has put before us, especially in 2 Peter chapter 3, have got to come to recognize that we are on the verge of not only leaving this place, but leaving behind individuals who desperately need us evangelistically. What if I were to tell you that your conversation today at noon is the last time you'll get to speak with that loved one about the Lord? Would it change the urgency of your conversation? Now, I can't tell you that this is your last conversation, but I can tell you, according to the authority of 2 Peter chapter 3 and many other places, that you've got to view it as if it were your last conversation. That is our responsibility as Christians. You must. If you are to be viable in this world, you must view this as your last opportunity to have one last fingerprint left upon this planet for God. You've got to view that in every conversation, every action that you take. With that said then, you come to this context that we're going to look at and pick apart this, this week together, 2 Peter chapter 3, and you find some 
rather revealing statements made by Peter, arguably one of the closest friends of Jesus on the planet. As he leaves behind these words, he's leaving them behind for people like you and I. Now, I don't think even Peter understood that we were going to be 2,000 years plus, that we're still waiting on Jesus to return. I think Peter really believed that probably in his lifetime he would see the sky split open and the church taken away. I think he believed that. I think John believed that and others believed it. It didn't happen. But that doesn't discredit what he says. In fact, I think it makes it a little more poignancy to you and I because if Peter believed that these things could happen in his lifetime, and we're 2,000 years plus removed from this time period when it was written, the obvious conclusion is we are closer to the return of Christ today than Peter ever dreamed of being. What kind of people are we to now, what I need to do this morning, and I know we, I can smell it coming up from the basement, so I, I'm anxious. I always eat really good here because Ramona makes sure that I'm not worried about us being weird, gluten-free people. We always have good potlucks. Most potlucks I get, I don't get gluten-free stuff. And so this, I've always looked forward to coming to Cherry Street. So I'm not going to draw this out, but I do need to establish something for the rest of the lessons. And that is, if these are the last days, okay, that word if, we need to establish that we are living in the last days. Now, I'm not going to be so presumptuous to give you times and dates and things of that nature. But, as, you know, in the words of my good friend Donnie McGee, as he often has stood in this very pulpit and told you, you know, we may not be able to tell the exact day, but we certainly know the season. And if we can know the season, I would like to suggest to you that the tree is ripe. And the season is now. And the message for you and I is, what kind of people are we going to be if we are living in these last days? I want to read just the opening paragraph of this. And again, like I say, we'll exhaust it all, God willing, during our time together. But just in the first two verses, notice what he says. Peter writes, dear friends, now this is my second letter to you. Now, I know you're, I mean, we're in Second Peter, so you're thinking, so that's pretty obvious. I don't, I'm not so much concerned about the second in the sense of a number as I am in the second in the sense of a repetition. Peter says, this has been so important to me that I am coming back to you again. I am going to write again. I've got to tell you something else. This is very, very important to me. This is on my heart. Now, how did it get on Peter's heart? Because the Holy Spirit put it there. So this is not just kind of a one-time shot in the dark. I'm just going to mention this in passing. No. Peter says, I'm coming back. He says, dear friends, now this is my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders. Both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. So both times that Peter writes this, his purpose is to make sure that they've got wholesome thinking, that their thought process is as it needs to be. I think one of the great struggles we have as Christians in our present day world is that in order for us to feel totally validated, you, we feel like we've got to strike out at somebody especially physically speaking. If I can just stand on the street corner and I can hold a placard that says such and such, or if I can write a, a letter to the editor and it get published in the newspaper, and sometimes we really struggle with feeling validated when it all stays in here. Now, I'm not suggesting we shouldn't have an impact on our world. That's not at all my point. But I am saying that that impact that we have on the world not only starts here, but is predominantly going to be governed by what is here. And Peter says, this is the second time I've write to, written to you so that you will have wholesome thinking. So that your mind will be centered where it needs to be because it all starts there. Centered on Christ. Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. We've got to have that whole inner being at work in order for us to be productive during these last days. He says, I've written these so that they stimulate you to wholesome thinking. And then verse 2 is what I wanted you to really see. I want you to recall, here's your wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. In other words, one of the things that he's doing is he's saying wholesome thinking is about looking over your shoulder and recognizing the teaching that has been had in the past. I think that, and I, I told a group of, of teenagers this just a week and a half ago when I was in Little Rock. One of the greatest mistakes you can make in life is to watch somebody who's walking ahead of you trip and fall on their face and you, three steps later, trip over the same object and fall on your face. That not only does it not even make any sense, there's no maturity there. If you see someone trip over something and fall on their face, 
you've got to process, you've got to say to yourself, I've got to miss that obstacle. I think one of the things that Peter is saying here to the church, to us, is that we've got to recognize what has taken place in the past. Now, obviously, not everybody in the past has tripped and fallen on their face, but many have. And in the past, we've gotten instructions about how to avoid the tripping and falling on your face. But the problem is, so often we avoid understanding the processing, the wholesome mindset of what has already been taught. And he's going to explain that to us in the coming night, so I'll, we'll look at that in detail. But what I, I like to do, because my rudder doesn't go very deep, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a, a very shallow thinker at times. What I like to do is, I like to just stop for a second and consider the, if we're in the last days. How do you know that? How, how can you come to that conclusion? Now, I'm not going to go off into a bunch of, of passages from Ezekiel or Daniel or even the book of Revelation. As much as I'm just going to try to apply some logic to this thing. Not that those passages would be bad, by the way. But for a simple-minded guy, one of the things that I would look at, if I truly believe in God, is what brought God to the conclusion in times past that the world needed judging, cleansing, needed to have his hand placed into the workings of the world a little more directly. And, and this is really simple to see. In fact, if you wanted to flip real quickly, you go back to the book of Genesis chapter 15. And in Genesis chapter 15, you see two of the most telling signs of God's approaching judgment or relief, if you will, of, to his people. In Genesis chapter 15, you, you find the story of Abraham. In fact, I'm going to flip open there just real quick. I think it would be good for me not only to read it to you, but I think that it would be good for you to see it in your own Bible. And I didn't get Kevin to put that thing up behind me because I didn't know that I had Mac capabilities here. In Genesis chapter 15, we've got the covenant of Abraham. And you know that this covenant, I mean, we make so much about this covenant. We talk about the land covenant. We, talk, all the, we, we make so much about this. But one of the things I think sometimes we forget to recognize that in this covenant, that there is also some indications about who God is and how God interacts with his people. And so Abraham, the father of the faithful, there are several things that take place. The first of which, when God is making the decision about when I've had enough, one of the things that he does is he considers the saturation point of wickedness. The saturation point of wickedness. In Genesis chapter 15, beginning at verse 15, it says this. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation, they will serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, and he's talking to Abraham, you, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. Then watch this. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here with... For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. I think there's something there that is not only a hint as to who God is, but it says so much about way, the way God deals with us with regards to when He is going to send His judgment upon the relief of God's people. And that is, He says, the sin of the Amalekites is not yet full. The saturation point of this wicked people has not yet reached its fullest level. Therefore, I'm not going to allow you, Abraham, present tense, to claim this land. Now, Abraham gets the land through his descendants. We know that. But he says it's going to be four generations later. You're going to die and go on to your father. It's going to be four generations. Now, it's going to happen. But you've got to understand that I also function within certain parameters. As a just God, there's certain things that I do. And one of them is this. I want people to come to repentance. And I am not going to up the time table just for my own convenience or for somebody even as special as Abraham. When that moment of saturation comes, the, the sin of the Amalekites is full. Believe me, we're going to take care of business. But until then, I'm going to allow myself to be, if you will, boxed in by my own justice. Now, let me take that particular point, because I only have two this morning. Take that particular point wrong with it with regards to America. I think that you can look in almost any direction today in America and, yea, the world, and see that we are either quickly approaching the saturation point of wickedness, or we're there. I just spent a week in Little Rock. 
Sandstone Drive Church of Christ. We do a map event there every year. Inner city kids. <coughs> One of the things we do mid-morning after several classes is we have a kind of a chapel period, if you want to call it that. It's just more of a worship time. We sing some songs, and then we, we ask the young people. It's very interactive. We ask the young people to participate, and they do various things. We, we do a show and tell. And I ask each uh, young, I assign a young person for each day, and they, they're to bring something from their home that inspires them spiritually. And there's all kinds of things that they should they do. A uh, favorite quote, and it doesn't necessarily have to be from the Bible. In fact, we encourage this particular one not to be from the Bible. And so, what's your favorite? So, uh, we've had people quote Dr. Seuss. We've all kinds of things. But how does that impact you spiritually? And then we also have okay, your five, favorite Bible passage, and we'll have somebody who does that. But the most meaningful time of this worship period is the testimonials. And every year, towards the end of our week, there are more and more people volunteering. They hear other people cry, they hear other people tell their story, etc. Towards the end of the week, more and more people are volunteering. Can I have a moment to tell my story? And some of these stories get elaborate, and, and they just, they make you weep. We have a little girl this past week who was sharing her story in Little Rock. And uh, she told how her folks literally dumped her out of the car along the side of the road because they didn't want her. She didn't go into explicit detail, but she mentioned that there had been sexual abuse. And I can go on and on with this. And you know stories like this as well. You don't have to have me tell you them in, in their gruesome details to say that you know our world is self-destructing. Some of the most spiritual people who I thought would be these icons of, of, of spiritual superhero-ness, if that's a word, have left their lives for other women. Individuals who I, I thought were so rock solid, whose faith has been shattered, and now don't even attend church regularly. We live in a perverted world. I don't think there's any doubt, or should be any doubt in our minds, that the saturation point of wickedness is all around us. We, we can see all the evidences of this. Economically speaking, that was kind of morally speaking, just economically speaking, you're, you're aware of what's happening in Detroit and all the craziness that's happening. How did we get there? How did they get there? Selfishness? This is greed. Greed's what took place there. You can go wherever you want with regards to all that took place and mismanagement and all those kind of things. But have you seen pictures of some of the spots in Detroit? I grew up not far from there. You ever seen, have you seen pictures? Of, I mean, it's almost post-apocalyptic. Some of the, the houses and the things that are happening. They, they say that the response time of the police department is about an hour. How do we get there? Because we are so greedy. We are so full of ourselves. We are so materialistic. Yeah, I, I think the saturation <laughs> point of not just America, but the world it is, is primed and ready for something big. And just as in the time of Abraham, God says, listen, I, I'll take care of this, but it's going to be when the sin of the Amalekites is full. I think the sin of the American is full. And I think that you and I need to be looking. Because I believe that today could be the last opportunity you get to speak to that loved one who doesn't know Jesus. We've got to ratchet up a, a level of urgency in the way that we talk and the attitudes that we have. But there's a second thing, and this one is, I think is, is, is equally as evident that God dealt, does with regards to making these decisions. The second thing comes just about three chapters later in, the cha in, in chapter 18. And you're familiar with this one. This is when the, the visitors come to Abraham and Sarah laughs at the idea that she could have a child in her old age. You remember that? And it, it says that the visitors, some of them, they go on towards Sodom and the Lord remains behind with Abraham and they have this conversation. And you remember the conversation. How Abraham says, well, Lord... You know, you being a just God, surely you're not going to, to, to wipe away this wicked city and in the process take the righteous as well. And you remember the dickering. And you remember how we begin to, to dicker down until we get to the you know, ten people. Surely if you found ten, you know. And, and you remember how we could, how Abraham was uh, unable to even point out ten people, righteous people in the city. The application, though, for that is, again... Not only is there a saturation point of wickedness, but I think that there is a, a ratio of the wicked to the righteous. And Sodom didn't mean it. <coughs> I wish I had time. I don't. 
there's a, there's a hundred other things I'd like to say about that particular story. The removal of Lot, yet the perversion of his daughters in the cave, the condition of his wife for looking back because she didn't evidently have the priorities that she needed to. A massive application there that I'll use as I conclude. What number of anchors do you have in this world that are causing you to constantly look back? Is it the house? The, the, the occupation? Is it from a young person's standpoint, what I always wanted to do. All these songs about our bucket list that are coming out now, you know, and make sure you, you know, if I could just, you know, ride Fu Manchu in 3.2 seconds or however that, that crazy song goes. You know, if I could just jump out of an airplane with, you know, what if, what if you were intended to have an empty bucket? What if a true Christian's Passion should be not what can I put in the bucket, but when can I shed the bucket? You see, one of the reasons that nightmare sticks with me and stays with me is because I feel very much like a Jeremiah. I so often feel like that I can yell and I can jump and I can tell fancy stories and I can quote the scriptures. <laughs> but I still see we as the church going through the same old motions as if tomorrow's going to be just like today. The sun will come up tomorrow. No. For the Christian, it may not. We may be elsewhere. What then? What does it take to rattle our cage what does it take to make a soul passionate about the return of Christ that He and His return is at the center of every decision I make from here on out? Making sure that I represent Him well so that my friends and loved ones will have the opportunity to know Him like I do. In chapter 18 of the book of Genesis, as I end this thing, in chapter 18, there's a, one little phrase that I wanted to share with you that I think is very important. Verses 20 through 23. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin so grievous, that I'll go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away, and they went toward Sodom, but Abraham returned, standing before the Lord. Verse 23, Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Two quick things. One, he says up here in verse 20, the outcry against this city has come. Who's crying? Did you ever think about that? Where's the outcry coming from in this, in this context? I can only assume it's the righteous or the innocent. We know from New Testament passages that Lot was an individual who was grieved because of what was taking place there in the city. Take that and run with it. Peter is going to say in our passage, and we're going to discover this week, Peter is going to say that there's something you can do to hasten the coming of the Lord. You know what that is? This is at least one of them. Your outcry. You ever wept for all the aborted babies? Have you ever wept? Now let me change that just a little bit, because that's so politically correct for us in, in, in the conservative world. Have you ever wept for the homosexual who doesn't want to be in that lifestyle? Years ago, San Francisco, a large woman, she came forward during at the end of one of my sermons. She was a practicing lesbian, and she said, Sonny, I don't like this, I don't want to be this, but you've got to understand where I'm at and the conditions that I'm living in. And she just fell into my arms, and she just wept. When's the last time that you cried out to God for deliverance for these individuals who don't want to be there? The addictions, pornography, drug abuse. When's the last time we have cried out for, for them to be delivered from these things? You see, I think one of the reasons the Lord is waiting is because our motives are not what they need to be. I know it's easy for us to say, 
Oh, that individual who abuses his children. Oh, that individual who lives that perverted lifestyle. All those kind of things. I recognize. But why doesn't God come? Peter's going to say, he wants everyone to come to repentance. What if we cried out to the heavens, not, Lord, come. But dear Lord, I can suck it up one more day. If there's one possibility that that individual would come to you. You see, there's maturity. I want to see the face of the Lord today. I want to go home right now. But what if real maturity is when I say, but Lord, not my will, thine be done. Because I know there are people around me who need yet to hear. And so, dear God, as much as I want Jesus to come and to take us out of here, I know what that means to my loved ones. Give me the strength to impact them correctly during the time that you give me. But the last thing is rather hopeful. He also says here in chapter 18, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Never. No. Doesn't happen. Ever. Oh, but you say, but what about that? Sure, there are times when the physical righteous, physical righteous in the sense that their physical bodies are swept away, but he never, ever deserts us, spiritually speaking. You may suffer, you may hurt, with regards to the persecution that comes upon us because of, of various things that are around us with our, our convictions. You may even hurt because of, of the various consequences that come upon you because you live within an area where there are wicked people. I recognize all of those kind of things, but never does he desert those who are righteous, ever. That which is of most importance to God will always be His. And that's us. And until He returns, there will be things that we suffer through. There will be hardships that come our way. America is likely sitting on this economic bubble that it is and other things that we've got going. America is likely to self-implode. And we will hurt because of it as righteous people. But we're not deserted. The coming of our Lord, it's ours, uniquely ours. And it will happen, and it will come. And one of the things Peter is saying in this passage is, don't buy into the scoffers who say, all these things have come about, all these days have turned one all on top of another, and where is the coming of the Lord? Where is it? Where is it? And nothing seems to be happening here. Don't buy into the scoffers. It's going to take place. But what if? Our motives have not been pure enough to recognize that the reason it is not yet taking place is because of what Peter says here. There are yet others who need to know. There are yet others who will come. If you and I can just, using football terminology, suck it up another day. And in the process, shine brightly. I can't give you a specific time. Nick can't give you a specific time. But I think we're fools not to recognize we're living in the season. And if today the church were to be removed, stop for a second and consider, who is it that you could have spoken to but didn't? We've got to take advantage of that because he's not come back yet. We are likely to have lunch in about 10, 15 minutes. Is there somebody, even in this room, you need to talk to? If these are the last days, what kind of people ought we to be? Urgent. Completely on fire with the message. Jeremiah, as I end, Jeremiah, my favorite of the prophets. Bless his heart. Forty plus years he prophesies. At the end, he's completely vindicated. Everything he said has come true. And the thing that always amazed me is after the remnant is remaining, and the majority are taken away into Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah stays behind with his folks. There's a little bit of a time passage, and they come to him, and they say, because we're concerned the Babylonian king is going to come down upon us because of various things that have happened, we don't know what to do. We, we, we think we're going to go to Egypt. What do you think? Jeremiah says, let me talk to God. And he asks for a time period to talk to God, which he takes, spends some time with God. God gives him a message. He says to Jeremiah, he says, here's the thing, you tell my people... Whatever you do, don't go to Egypt. Don't go to Egypt, whatever you do. That's the message. So Jeremiah, who 40 plus years has prophesied, everything he's prophesied has come true. He's the man. 
And you would think they'd recognize that. Jeremiah steps back in front of the remnant and he says, okay, I've got the message from God. God says, whatever we do, don't go to Egypt. You know what they immediately did? Packed their bags and went to Egypt. And I find such a parallel in the church. Whatever you do, don't spend the rest of your day thinking about anything except the fact that today could be the day that I'm taken out of here so I've got to get urgently about the business of God. Whatever you do, don't focus on other stuff. Whatever you do, don't get bogged down in materialism. Whatever you do, don't put anchors down here because we're leaving. Whatever you do. And so what's the church do? First thing, out of the box, we put down more anchors. We find more excuses to divert our attention to something that is more pleasuresome to us than the fact that my neighbor could be lost eternally. That reoccurring nightmare is there because I so often feel like we're just not getting the message. It's going to happen. What kind of people are we to be because of that? We're going to sing this invitation song, and if your heart is not where it needs to be, that urgency is not a flame within your life, or you've never named the sweet name of Jesus and put him on in baptism so that you could be one of his children, we sing this song so that you'll be convicted. I beg of you not to put it off. I don't know how much time is left. Please, come forward if you need to, as we stand, as we sing.